the Lacanian subject, the structure and function of self and other in a fallen world. It's a title that came to mind as I was thinking about making this video, and I'm going to be doing a close reading of the preface and maybe the first chapter of the Lacanian subject uh, by Bruce Fink. This book is a sort of staple in Lacanian studies. Uh, I think it was um, translated in 19, mid 1990s, and it uh, discusses. Uh, the very enigmatic topic of what is the subject according to Lacan. And we can think of uh, the subject as what is the person? What does it mean to be a person? How does uh, the person operate in the world with relationships between himself and others, his family, his friends, his community, and between him and institutions, um, uh, the government, the law, aca the academy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's kind of the nature um, of the exploration here. And I wanted to, in continuing this dialogue between Eastern uh, uh, Christian Orthodox anthropology and psychoanalysis, I'm going to be fudging some of the terms that were introduced here or going to be considering some terms from uh, the church fathers and from Genesis and, and in from um, Eastern Orthodoxy in general. And looking at some of these terms and how they constitute the subject, the self, and the relationship between, um, again, others and, and the world. So bear with me here. Um, and a lot, this is a speculation and, and uh, a little bit of experimentation. So I'd love feedback here uh, for all four of you that are really interested in the convergence between these two seemingly disparate systems. But uh, anyways, um, let's see. So I'll just start here. So Lacan presents us with a radically new theory of subjectivity. Again, what it means to be a human. Unlike, unlike most post-structuralists who seek to deconstruct and dispel the very notion of the human subject, Lacan, the psychoanalyst, finds the concept of subjectivity indispensable and explores what it means to be a subject. How one comes to be a subject, the conditions responsible for the failure to become a subject, leading to psychosis, and the tools in the analyst's disposal to induce a, quote, precipitation of subjectivity. So I would claim that uh, the subject that is being explored here is the subject in a fallen world. Um, that's why there are so many short circuits in our um, attempts and abilities to feel uh, or to rid this innate feeling of alienation that makes up human subjectivity in the 20 and 21st 21st century. So this is kind of like a phenomenology of being in a fallen world. Continuing here the text. It is, however, extremely difficult to piece together the wide variety of things Lacan says about the subject, his theory of the subject being so unintuitive to most of us. Consider the definition Lacan so often reiterates, the subject is that which one signifier represents to another signifier and evolving quite significantly in the course of his work. Moreover, in the late 90, 1970s and 80s in the United States, Lacan was probably better known as a structuralist due to the discussion of his work on language and on Edgar Allan Poe, The Purloin Letter. And readers in the English-speaking world are often more familiar with a Lacan who uncovers the workings of structure at every turn. By structure here, um, I'm thinking of the structure of the of the fallen world, right? So elucidating and and uh, pointing to the environment that that is in the background that recedes in the background. Um, so I put kind of the term symbolic order is a very well-known term. So the symbolic order as it's discussed in certain contexts, is the fallen world, right? It says, even at the very core of what we take to be our most precious, inalienable, quote-unquote, selves, seemingly leaving aside the problematic of subjectivity altogether. In part one of this book, I retrace Lacan's extremely far-reaching examination of otherness. This is another term I want to uh, define a little bit, right? Uh, the term otherness as that which is alien or foreign to and as yet unspecified subject. So otherness as that which is alien or foreign to the subject, right? So the otherness, um, he, he calls it other, uh, the other as language, which I demarcated as the dark logos, right? The dark logos is a term from uh, Dugan. Um, and just like we have the logos, the light of consciousness that shines, there's also a dark logos, right? Which has been instantiated by the fall that operates in darkness. And I would say that this 
is the unconscious as well or can we can think of it in interesting ways as the unconscious um, I wrote here in my notes the unconscious is the purview of the dark logos the battlefield of spiritual warfare again we're having a little fun here continuing here that otherness runs the unlikely gamut Fink says from the unconscious the other as language which she calls the unconscious here and the ego the imaginary other and the other as desire ego ideal so the ego i wrote a here uh, the ego is is lifted up as an idol in this system in the fallen world we idolize our ego right in a sense so ego idol it says back to the text we are alienated in so far as we are spoken by a language that functions in certain respects like a machine right so this this what made me think of this this dark logos notion here he says we are alienated in so far as we are spoken by a language that functions in certain respects like a machine computer or recording assembling device with a life of its own in so far as our needs and pleasures are organized and channeled into socially acceptable forms by our parents demands the other as demand and in so far as our desire and I'm using the word sin all right, to miss the mark here or when the word desire comes up in certain contexts. So kind of try to keep that uh, in mind as well. And insofar as our desire comes into being with the other's desire. So insofar as our sin comes into being as the other's sin. While Lacan incessantly invokes the subject in his seminars and written texts, the other very often seems to steal the limelight. Yet it is precisely the extension of the concept of structure or otherness in Lacan's work to its furthermost reaches that allows us to see where structure leaves off and something else begins, something that takes exception to structure. In Lacan's work, that which takes exception is twofold, the subject and the object, the object A as cause of desire. So the object I wrote here um, is the knowledge of good and evil. It is the um, fallen fallen interpretation and experience of love and hate so the object is the the fruit that we keep coming back to time after time after time in part two of this book i show that departing from his early phenomenological notions in the 1950s lacan defines the subject as a position adopted with respect to the other as language the dark logos or law in other words, the subject is, is a relationship to the symbolic order. So the subject is a relationship to the fallen world. The ego, the idol, right, is defined in terms of the imaginary register. So the imaginary is the place where uh, power and images operate in the three registers. And that is where Lacan um, puts the ego, right? So the ego is an idol, it's an image, um, whereas the subject as such is essentially a positioning in relation to the other as lacan's notion of the other evolves the subject is reconceptualized as a stance adopted with respect to the other's desire to the other's sin the mother's the parents the parents sin insofar as that sin arouses the subject's sin that is functions as object a so object a is a term um it's a, a very popular term that means the object cause of desire that 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 which what did i write for object a here i don't think i put it in oh yeah it's it's worship it's a form of worship in a fallen world uh, it's like a the structure and function of a fallen worship because we imbue our identity and our subjectivity in this object a or this object a is what triggers our cathexis he calls it our libidinal investment and i would also say that this is essentially the uh, analogous to the economy of the passions and how they operate in, in Eastern Orthodoxy, right? The passions, which I, um, the term jouissance, I translated in this experiment as the passion or, or the economy of the passions. Continuing, ever more influenced by Freud's earliest work, in his own psychoanalytic practice, Lacan begins to cast his theoretical evolution in very schematic terms to see that something in relation to which the subject adopts a stance as a primal experience of pleasure pain or trauma the subject comes into being as a form of attraction toward and defense against a primordial overwhelming experience of what the french call jouissance 
So the subject comes into being, Lacan says, as a form of attraction toward and defense against, right? Good and evil, love and hate, right? Uh, that's, that's what made me think of this. Against a primordial and overwhelming experience of jouissance. Now he defines jouissance here as a pleasure that is excessive, leading to a sense of being overwhelmed or disgusted, yet simultaneously providing a source of fascination. If that's not the economy of the passions or the continuous fractal uh, taking of the fruit, so to speak. I don't know what is. I'll say it again. Uh, so jouissance is a pleasure that is excessive, leading to a sense of being overwhelmed or disgusted, right? Think about overeating, overindulging in drugs or overindulging on anything, right? It is, uh, it, it's something that is overwhelming, is pleasurable, excessive, overwhelming, disgusting, and fascinating. That's what jouissance, the phenomenology of jouissance is here. Continuing here, uh, while in the late 1950s, Lacan views being as something granted the human subject due only to its fantasized relation to the object, fantasy is an important term. I wrote, the fantasy is the serpent story, right? The subtle serpent, which um, Eve could hear, right? That fed, fed her the lie of becoming like God it, that gave her and Adam and Eve this sense of self-mastery, this fallen sense of self-mastery that is at the root of the problem of things here. So I'm um, using the term fantasy. I'm thinking of it in this way. So, uh, yep. He eventually formulates the subject's primordial experience of jouissance as stemming from its traumatic encounter with the other's desire. Stemming from the traumatic encounter with the other's sin. The subject, lacking in being, right? The sinful subject, lacking in being, right? The sin means to miss the mark, is thus seen to consist in a relation to or a stance adopted with respect to the other's desire, the other's sin, as fundamentally thrilling and yet unnerving, fascinating and yet overwhelming or revolting. That is the phenomenology of sin, if, if, you, if you'd ask me, right? It's thrilling, unnerving, fascinating, overwhelming, and revolting. Yet we keep coming back to it. So it's this repetition, compulsion. Um, while child wishes to be recognized by its parents as worthy of their desire, their desire is both mesmerizing and lethal. Their sin, right? While child wishes to be recognized by its parents as worthy of their, of their sin, their sin is both mesmerizing and lethal. The subject's precarious existence is sustained by fantasies constructed to keep the subject at just the right distance from that dangerous desire, from that passion, from that sin, from that demonic influence, from that diabolic influence, balancing the attraction and repulsion, the balancing good and evil. Nevertheless, that is, in my view, but one face of the Canian subject. The subject is fixated as symptom, as a repetitive, symptomatic way of getting off or obtaining jouissance, right? So the subject is defined here as one that is brought into the world through the inflammation of the passions and of sin. The sense of being that is provided by fantasy, right? The serpent's lie, the serpent's story is, he says, quote unquote, false being as Lacan refers to in the mid-1960s, suggesting thereby that there is something more. Where is, what is this something more that is not this fallen world, this fallen symbolic order, this false being? And the goal of analysis is to realize this something more, I'd say here. And I think there's some more resonances with, um, with this idea in Eastern Orthodoxy as well. So back to the text. Uh, predictably enough, the second face of the Lacanian subject appears in the overcoming of that fixation the reconfiguring or traversing the fantasy, the lie, right? Traversing the lie and the shifting of the way in which one gets one's kicks or obtains jouissance or shifting the way which one addresses and is engaged with the passions, right? They're called the passions in Eastern Orthodoxy because it's that which we are passive against, right? They act in us and we are passive to them you know, addictions, proclivities, obsessions, neuroses, whatever it may be. 
that is the face of so subjective subjectivization is this process right a process of making quote one's own something that was formerly alien subjectivization which is kind of the, the goal here early on in lacanian uh, analysis is the process of making one's own something that was formerly alien so the process of in eastern orthodoxy is, is threefold it's purification illumination and deification right this initial part reminds me of the idea of, of purification of changing what one gets uh their rocks off one understanding and transforming what one gets off on right so it's this idea of purification through this process a complete reversal occurs in one's position in relation to the other's desire to the other's sin one assumes responsibility for the other's sin so th the goal here right let's think of the desire as sin again one assumes responsibility for the other's sin that foreign power that brought one into being one takes that causal alterity upon oneself you take the sins of the world upon yourself subjectifying what had previously been experienced as an external extraneous cause you know the the um the log in someone's else someone else's eye or the speck in someone else's eye it's it's a turn to take the the log you know from from the biblical passage out of one's own eye right by experience as an external extraneous cause a foreign roll of the dice at the beginning of one's universe destiny Lacan suggests here a paradoxical move by the anal uh, by the analyzand the analyzand is the person that is in analysis prepared by a specific approach on the analyst's part to subjectify the cause of his or her existence the other's desire the other sin that brought him or her into this world and to become the subject of his or her her own fate right to obtain personhood sovereignty not it uh, yeah hence the gist of lacan's multiple translation of freud's where the other where the other pulls the strings acting as my cause i must come into being as my own cause right where the other where uh the passions the demons or the the pull of the full and the fallen world pulls the strings acting as my cause i must come into being as my own cause let's see i might just leave it there let's see yeah there's a lot more here let's right, see if i keep going as for the object remember the knowledge of good and evil in in some respect it evolves alongside the theory of the subject just as the subject is first viewed as a stance adopted with respect to the other and then with respect to the other's desire the object is first viewed as another like oneself and is eventually equated with the other's desire the parent's desire brought the child into the world in a very material sense serving as cause of the child's very being and eventually as cause of its desire fantasy stages the position in which the child would like to see itself with respect to the object that causes elicits and incites its desire it is lacan's theory of the object as cause of desire not as something which could somehow satisfy desire that allows us to understand certain of lacan's innovations in analytic technique lacan reconceptualizes the analyst's position in terms of the roles the analyst must avoid those of imaginary other and of judgmental all-knowing other implicit and ego psychology approaches so lacan is warning that the analyst is not to take the role of the imaginary other right this ego that is a rival of the of the analyzant uh, and of the judgmental all-knowing other implicit in ego psychology so the analyst is not supposed to be the person that knows everything the judgmental uh you know or that analyst becomes worshipped and becomes idolized so lacan is saying here that you are not to become an ego rival of the analyzant and you are not to be the um the one subject that's supposed to know towards the analyzant because that elicits a desire of love actually it's an infatuation that happens in analysis um when that happens he, i think he's saying here <laughs>
It is Lacan's theory of the object of cause of desire, not as something which could somehow satisfy desire and that allows us to understand a certain Lacan's innovations in analytic technique. Lacan reconceptualizes, I'm reading this again, the analyst's position in terms of the roles the analyst must avoid, those of the imaginary other and of judgmental all-knowing other implicit in ego psychology and approaches, and the role he or she must position him, him or herself to play in the subject's fantasy, object A, in order to bring about ever greater subjectivization by the analyzand of the foreign causes that brought him or her into being. In Lacan's view of the analytic setting, the analyst is not called on to play the quote-unquote good object, the quote-unquote good enough mother, or the strong ego which allies with the patient's weak one. Rather, the analyst must, by maintaining a position of enigmatic desire, come to serve as object in the subject's fantasy in order to bring about a reconfiguration of fantasy, right? Fantasy is the serpent story. So the goal here in analysis is a reconfiguration of fantasy, a new stance in relation to jouissance, the passions, a new subject position. One of the tools for doing so at the analyst's disposal is time. The variable length session being a means by which to generate the tension necessary to separate the subject from its fantasized relation to the other's desire. There's a lot more there, but let me uh, fast forward a bit here to, um, that was in the preface. Uh, chapter one is entitled uh, Language and Otherness. And here he's going to bring in this notion of an, an other that speaks through the subject. And this is thought of through slips of tongue, through uh, mumbling words. Uh, this is very important in Freud and in Lacan, because the idea here is that other, which is a foreign body, uh, which is within one's, within the subject that is an analysis, speaks sometimes, right? And it's, that's where the truth is exposed or, or there a truth event can happen or the, the process of subjectivization can occur there. So quickly here he says, uh, a patient walks into his analyst's office and sits down in the armchair. He looks at the analyst right in the eye, picks up the thread where he left off at the end of the last session and immediately makes a blunder saying, quote, I know that in my relationship with my father, there was a lot of tension. And I think it came from the fact that he was working too hard at a schnob he couldn't stand and took it out on me. He meant to say job, but schnob came out instead. Discourse is never one dimensional. A slip of the tongue immediately reminds us that more than one discourse can use the same mouthpiece at the same time. If that's not saying that there are multiple egregores at play, there are multiple larval selves uh, underneath one's subjective identity or ego, I don't know uh, what else that would be saying there. So he says, discourse again is never one dimensional. A slip of the tongue immediately reminds us that more than one discourse can use the same mouthpiece at the same time. What is the nature of this discourse? I'd say, and Lacan says that the unconscious is structured like a language, like a logos, right? But it's a dark logos because it, it is in, uh, it, it, it recedes. And the way that it operates through, um, it's, um, through different ways, we'll get into a little bit later. And again, this, this isn't, this isn't, these aren't perfect, uh, you know, uh, elaborations here, but they're just to spur some thought from some thoughts, right? Since two distinct levels can be identified here, an intentional discourse consisting of what the speaker was trying to say or meant to say, and an unintentional discourse of which in the case takes the form of the deformed or garbled word, a kind of conflation of job, snob, and perhaps other words as well. All right, moving a little bit forward. The simple example already allows us to distinguish between two different types of discourse or more simply stated, two different types of talk. One, ego talk, everyday, talk about what we consciously think and believe about ourselves. This ego talk is structured and functions within a fallen world. So this everyday talk about what we consciously think and believe about ourselves is this, uh, like Heidegger's term of, of das man, right? This empty chatter. And then there's some other kind of talk just leaves it translated like that, which I am going which I'm um, using the term dark logos here. Lacan's other is, at its most basic level, related to that other kind of talk. For we can tentatively assume that there are not only two different kinds of talks, but that 
they come, roughly speaking, from two different psychological places, the ego or self and the other. Psychoanalysis begins with the presupposition that the other kind of talk stems from another which is locatable in some sense. It holds that unintentional words that are spoken, blurted out, mumbled, and garbled come from some other place, some other agency than the ego. Freud called that other place the unconscious, and Lacan states in no uncertain terms that, quote, the unconscious is the other's discourse. The unconscious is the other's discourse. So it is the low guy of the dark logos, right? That is, the unconscious consists of those words, the low guy, which come from some other place than ego talk. At this most basic level, then, the unconscious is the other's discourse. Now, how did that other discourse wind up, quote unquote, inside of us? I would say pride. And I would say that he even says it here, kind of. He says, um, now, how did the other's discourse wind up, quote unquote, inside of us? We tend to believe, he says, that we are in control. And yet at times, something extraneous and foreign speaks, as it were, through our mouths. From the viewpoint of the self or ego, I runs the show, pride. That, ras that aspect of us we call I believes that it knows what it thinks and feels and believes that it knows why it does what it does. Moving a little bit further down about this foreignness here. Um, in this chapter, my focus is not so much how this other discourse works, but rather how it got there. How did it get, quote unquote, inside of us? How did something which seems so extraneous or foreign wind up speaking through our mouths? Lacan accounts for the foreignness as follows. We are born into a world of discourse, a discourse or language that precedes our birth and that we will live on after our death. I would say that this discourse or language is the logos of the fallen world, so the dark logos, right? A discourse or language that precedes our birth and that we will live on after our death. You can think of it almost as an ancestral sin as well. Uh, so long before a child is born, a place is prepared for it in its parents' linguistic universe. The parents speak of the child yet to be born, try to select the perfect name for it, prepare a room for it, and begin imagining what their lives will look like, will be like with the additional member of the household. The words they use to talk about the child have often been in use for decades, if not centuries, and the parents have generally neither defined nor redefined them despite many years of use. Those words are handed down to them by centuries of tradition. They constitute the other of language, as Lacan calls it in French, but which may try to render us, render as the linguistic other or the other as language. A child is thus born into a pre-established place in its parents' linguistic universe, a space often prepared many months, if not years, before the child sees the light of day. And most children are bound to learn the language spoken by their parents, which is to say that in order to express their wishes, they are virtually obliged to go beyond the crying stage, a stage in which their parents must try to guess what it is their child, the child wants and needs, and try to say what they want in so many words, that is, in a way that is comprehensible to their primary caretakers. Their wants are, however, molded in that very process, for the words they are obliged to use are not their own and do not nece necessarily correspond to their own particular demands. Their very desires are cast in the mold of the language or languages that they learn. I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, let me know what you guys think. If you want to continue in this line here, I, I will. Um, but let me know what you think if any of these words or any of these uh, these juxtapositions or these um, uh, you know these overlaps here that I'm uh, pointing out to if they seem right or wrong or what you think in general uh, but thanks for listening and I will see you guys next time.